Welcome to the New Testament Review, where we discuss classic works of New Testament literature. I'm Ian Mills, and today I'm joined by Ken Olson. It's another Synoptic Problem episode, so Laura's out and I've called in Ken. I need to find a reason to kick you off the show sometime, Ian. We're going to be discussing Austin Fair's 1955 essay on dispensing with Q. Ken, who was Austin Fair? Austin Ferrer was an Anglican clergyman who taught at Oxford. He actually wasn't a professor because the British system is quite different. News even more different at the time. He was actually the chaplain of Trinity College. And in that office, he knew a number of people, important intellectuals at Oxford, one of whom was C.S. Lewis. Uh, <laughs> he was, since he was an Anglican clergyman, he actually conducted the funeral ceremonies both for Lewis's wife, uh, Joy Davidman, and for Lewis himself. I cannot imagine Lewis giving the synoptic problem a second of his time. Right. Ferrer is mostly <laughs> known now for beginning the Ferrer theory that Luke used Matthew. But at the time, he was actually a very important theologian in the Anglican Church. In case you're not familiar with the field, uh, the Ferrer hypothesis is currently the front-running alternative to the two-source hypothesis, which still holds the majority of scholars. And the Ferrer hypothesis, also called the ferrer golder hypothesis, and the ferrer golder goodacre hypothesis, is that Luke used Matthew, and so there's no need for a hypothetical Q. So, Ken, is the Ferrer the first author to, to propose that Luke used Matthew as well as holding Mark in priority? Well, he's not. Um, James Ropes had already done this, an American named James Ropes and his student, Martin Scott Enslin. Right. So if you haven't listened to our Streeter episode, go listen to that first. Um, Streeter is one, of the, is one of the early great champions of the Q hypothesis, and we're now turning to one of the first great champions of the Fair hypothesis, namely <laughs> Austin Fair. Who gave it its name, yes. Fair starts out by saying that he is not going to be arguing that Streeter reasoned incorrectly, but rather that Streeter started with different assumptions. He thinks one of the key differences between him and Streeter is that Streeter viewed the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Luke, as merely a compiler of Jesus' traditions. Um, think here of E.P. Sanders' idea of the conservation of matter in the Gospel traditions. Streeter assumed that if Luke had access to a Jesus tradition, he would, of course, have included it. So the only way to conceive of Luke omitting so much of Matthew is that he simply was ignorant. Ferrer, on the other hand, views Luke as many people do now with, after the decline of form criticism as a creative author. Um, and of course, creative authors, we expect to omit material, to change material. Um, we don't expect them to simply take over as much of their source as possible. That's not what authors do. This difference in assumptions is going to run through different parts of our conversation today. But he opens with this, and I think this is actually a really important thing to grasp. Right. Just to clarify, conservation of matter and energy, what's the similarity there? It's that the idea that Streeter is working with is the evangelists just rearranged all of their sources. They didn't, you know, nothing was lost and nothing was added. They just sort of moved stuff around. Right. And that's not how authors typically work. I think we're, we're beguiled by Matthew's use of Mark. Um, in this way, that this is this is a one-off. This is not how other gospels work that we see in the early Christ in early Christianity. This is not how authors in Jewish scripture using sources have worked. This is an irregular thing. So then he moves to argue that Luke's ignorance of Matthew is not merely one argument in favor of Q. That if it dropped off, you could still continue believing in Q. Rather, it's the constitutive explanandum for Q. Luke's ignorance of Matthew is not merely one argument for the existence of Q, but rather the justification for positing this hypothetical document. Luke's ignorance of Matthew is the question to which Q is the answer. There are people who suggest maybe Luke knew Matthew and still a Q existed. And this, Ferrer is, is pointing out, is not a reasonable position. Because Q is a hypothetical document. And he's going to go on in the next two sections to argue that Q is actually an implausible document. There are good reasons to think that all other things being equal, Q shouldn't exist. But if Luke didn't know Matthew, in spite of these implausibilities, minor agreements, no lack of generic analogs, um, in spite of... All of these reasons to think that Q is implausible, we should still believe in Q if Luke didn't know Matthew. As Streeter conceives of it, um, all other things are not equal, and we'll get to there in a, get there in a second. But it needs to be reasserted that 
Luke's ignorance of Matthew is the only reason, and in fact, good reason, to think that Q exists. He's not making the argument that lots of two-source hypothesis people like to critique that we don't have any copies of Q, so Q must not exist. Ferrer, Golder, Goodacre, people who, you know, actually work on the Ferrer theory don't usually make this argument. This is an argument you find in N.T. Wright. One more thing about that is that when you when you need to posit Q, uh, Ferrer's point is they don't they're not, they don't compete on an equal footing. All he has to do is show that Luke's use of Matthew is plausible. He doesn't need to show it happened exactly like this. He just needs to show it is plausible that Luke knew Matthew. Therefore, we don't need to hypothesize. Q. Right. There are of course circumstantial reasons for thinking that Luke's use of Matthew is plausible. They're both Gentile Christians. They both live in communities where Mark circulates. I would suggest there's no reason to think that early Christian literary networks are hermetically sealed, geographically isolated communities. These are people living probably in cities and interacting with other kinds of Christians. (laughs) The gospel, this is not an argument for unfair, but the gospel of Mark transgressed the largest early division in early Christian theology between law-observant Christians like Matthew and non-observant Christians like Luke. And if this document can transgress such boundaries, um, there's no reason to think that Matthew doesn't cross over to reach Luke the way Mark did. And I think I would urge caution there because Ferrer actually does say that both Matthew and Luke are Gentile Christians. And I think I don't necessarily agree that either of them, they could have been, but I don't know that either of them was. Fair enough. Yeah. (laughs) Ferrer then raises a number of reasons to think that Q is a priori, that is, before looking at the textual arrangement of the Gospels, Q is implausible. Uh, Just a reminder, he's going to go on and say that in spite of all these things, Q must exist if Luke doesn't know Matthew. First, Ferrer says there are no generic analogs. Right, and what does he mean by that? It's sometimes thought that uh, Ferrer meant there was no such thing as a saying source, and then, of course, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, which was first published, around the same time shows there were such things as a saying source. Well, he didn't say there were no saying sources. It's not quite clear what he meant, but what he said was there are no generic analogies for something like Q. We don't see something that looks like Q, which starts out with a strong narrative exordium or introduction. It talks about John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus, and it's got this strong narrative, and then all of a sudden we get these sayings, and some of them aren't even attached. We don't know who's speaking them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. And then it ends with a bunch of oracles about something that's going to happen in the future. He says, there might be, if we could fit this into a known genre, or if we could tell this was just the sort of thing the church would have needed to produce, even if they didn't, you know, have a known genre for it, then we could believe in Q. But nothing looks like this, and it doesn't right. look like it meets, meets any particular need. Another a priori reason to think Q is implausible um, is that Q, as it's reconstructed uh, by most two-source hypothesis people, doesn't have a passion account. So we need to conceive of a Jewish Christian in about, you know, the mid-60s, writing about a messianic claimant who died by crucifixion and not discussing that. Um, He's got this great line, quote, no Jew could apologize for the cross unless he could glory in it. We've sort of lost sense of how scandalous a death by crucifixion is. But the notion that a Jewish author could believe someone was the Messiah um, who died by crucifixion and just not discuss that or think that was irrelevant to his messianic claims, Ferrer is going to say is really, really implausible. Rather, everything we see from early Christianity, that is until we reach Gnosticism at least, who sometimes, who more or less deny that Jesus was in fact crucified, everything we see from the early Christians is that in order to continue believing that Jesus was Messiah, they had to argue that Jesus had to be crucified, that the Messiah, that the Messiah was prophesied to be crucified and he had to. So this is, they, they gloried in it, uh, as Ferrer phrases it. And Ferrer does address the idea that, well, okay, maybe Q doesn't have an analogy, but what about, you know, M and L? The opponent that Ferrer has in mind throughout this article is B.H. Streeter and the Four Gospels. And Streeter suggested there's a Q document, an L document, and an M document. And Ferrer's point was, yes, but these documents serve the purposes of source criticism. It's convenient as a solution to the synoptic problem that documents like these existed, but it doesn't look like anything the church would have needed if you in the first century. Like, write out everything that's in M, write out everything that's in L, they don't look like documents. Uh, n- neither does Q. 
And the, the vast majority of scholars today who accept the Q theory would still agree that Farrow was right with respect to L and M. There wasn't an L document and there wasn't an M document. The letters L and M just refer to the things that are only in Luke and the things that are only in Matthew. Then we turn to the a posteriori evidence for a genetic relationship between Matthew and Luke. That is evidence from the data of the Gospels that Luke knew Matthew and so Q doesn't exist. And I remind you, we are still in Fair's prolegomena. He is still, after all of this, going to say that if there are further reasons for, to believe that Luke didn't know Matthew, then we are justified in explaining all of this away. Um, but, but what is the textual evidence for Luke's knowledge of Matthew? These can be broken into minor and major agreements, or minor agreements and Mark Q overlaps. So the minor agreements are places where Matthew and Luke are both copying a story out of Mark, but they make the same change to Mark. They both agree with each other against Mark on a small detail. So in the Passion narrative, Jesus is bi blindfolded. Um, there's no cue here, uh, even according to the cue source theorists. In both Matthew and Luke, the guards say to Jesus, who is it that struck you? This is not present in Mark. So here we have an addition in both Matthew and Luke that's absent in Mark. Similarly, in the nativity scene, Matthew and Luke's nativity, where there is no nativity in Mark, Matthew and Luke agree verbatim on this phrase, you shall call his name Jesus, which an angel says to Mary or Joseph, respectively. So this is another place where there is no cue, but Matthew and Luke are adding something, but Matthew and Luke agree together. One more, in the preaching of John the Baptist, Mark has John the Baptist say, he will baptize you in the spirit. And Matthew and Luke both add, and with fire. This sort of thing shouldn't happen. Uh, Matthew and Luke are copying the preaching out of Mark and both add this phrase, three word phrase, and with fire. So these are agreements that shouldn't exist. And Fair's objection to what Streeter did was that it simply atomizes the evidence. He makes a generalization. Well, there aren't any cases where Matthew and Luke agree against Mark. Well, okay, so there are a lot of cases where Matthew against Mark, but some of those are due to Mark Q overlap. Some of them are scribal error harmonization. Some of them are due to a different use, a, a different version of Mark, either an earlier version of Mark or a later version of Mark. Sometimes it's coincidental stylistic changes. Sometimes it's a, a theological correction to Mark. And Ferrer isn't actually disputing that any of these are possible. What he's saying is, yes, once you've deduced that Luke didn't know Matthew, then you need these explanations. But if you don't accept that in the first place, yeah, there are a lot of places where Luke and Matthew agree against Mark, and that should count as evidence that Luke knew Matthew. So in addition to these five categories of, of ex ways of explaining coincidental agreements between Matthew and Luke, uh, Streeter has a sixth category, which are substantial agreements that don't work with any of these other solutions. And these come to be called in the, the study of the Synoptic Gospels, the Mark-Q overlaps, because Streeter says, in these cases, Mark and Q both had the same story, and Matthew and Luke copy out of Mark a uh, part of the story, and then both together turn to Q. So, famously, the temptation. Uh, Mark's temptation story is really short. Uh, Matthew and Luke both add these three episodes, these three specific temptation episodes. Beelzebub controversy, uh, Matthew and Luke both add the phrase, if it is by the Holy Spirit or the finger of God that I cast out demons, and the parable of the mustard seed, the preaching of John the Baptist. So there are these places where we have Matthew and Luke making substantial additions to the Gospel of Mark, where they are also copying verbatim out of Mark. All of Streeter's solutions are speculative solutions. That is to say, there is no independent evidence to corroborate these things. These are things that if you already are convinced of your paradigm, that Luke doesn't know Matthew, so Q must exist, these are reasonable ways to explain away some data that doesn't fit in that paradigm. Um, and this is not, I mean, this, this is a reasonable thing to do. If you have good independent reasons for believing that Luke doesn't know Matthew and therefore Q must exist. So all of them, all of the things being equal, um, Fair just wants at this point to succeed in showing you that all other things being equal, the minor and major agreements would indicate a literary relationship between Matthew and Luke. For Streeter, of course, all things are not equal. The evidence against Luke's knowledge of Matthew justifies making these speculative solutions. And I think 
so far, Streeter and Fair are both right. Um, this is methodologically sound. Ken and I both believe in the reasonableness of the Q hypothesis. People who dismiss Q as just speculative or they don't know what they're- we don't have any manuscripts of it, so we shouldn't believe in it- don't understand the issue. Q hinges on whether or not there is evidence of Luke's ignorance of Matthew strong enough to justify speculative solutions to explain away all the data we just covered. So I think that part of the chap- that part of the article is really important for laying out the methodological structure of the issue, uh, but Ken and I both agree that this next section, being only three pages, is probably our favorite. By far the strongest section of Farrer's article. Yes, uh, and we're more or less going to skip sections three and four, so uh, this isn't going to be too long. So in section two, uh, Fair lays out five principal reasons that we would think St. Luke could not have read St. Matthew. And Fair, being an Anglican clergyman, always calls them saint rather than just Luke and Matthew. Okay, first is there are texts in St. Matthew which St. Luke would not have omitted if he had been acquainted with them. Second, where St. Matthew and St. Luke give the same saying of Christ, St. Luke's wordings sometimes appear to be the more primitive. That is, he has an earlier version of the story. Third, uh, if Luke had, we have a model for how Luke writes. We know how he used St. Mark. So he, we would expect that he would have used Matthew in the same way he used St. Mark. And he's kept Mark in the same order that Mark had it. Right? When he uses Mark's material, he follows Mark's order. But if he's using Methian material, he seems to have come up with a new order for it. He's not following the same order. Fourth, St. Matthew seems to have more appropriate places in his gospel for placing that material. If Luke knew Matthew's superior placement, why wouldn't he have used it? Fifth, in much of the common material, uh, Matthew has placed it within Mark and Pericopes, and Luke has never placed his material that he shares with Matthew within Mark and Pericopes in the same place Matthew has put it. If he knew where Matthew put it, why doesn't he ever follow him? To be clear, Ferrer is here laying out reasons that other people have given to think that Luke is ignorant of Matthew. He's now going to go and show why all of these reasons don't work. So the first one returns to the issue we opened with. Luke is an author, not a compiler. He's writing a story, not simply putting together all of the Jesus traditions he has received. So there is no reason to think that if Luke had access to Matthew, that he would have to take over all of Matthew's material. This again returns to Sanders' argument about the conservation of matter and energy. Authors in antiquity, and today, don't think that when you're using a source, you need to pull over all of it. Um, they select what is appropriate, they change where needed. Um, Luke is not using his sources the way the forum critics assumed he must have. The second argument for Luke's not what lack of knowledge of Matthew, is that Luke seems to have the earlier version of some stories. This is called alternating primitivity. Sometimes Matthew has it, sometimes Luke. And if Luke has the earlier version of a story, then it, he must not be getting it from Matthew. And Farrah concedes, well, that's true. The problem is, how do we tell which is the earlier version of a story? And we're just not capable of doing that. Now, it's important to lay out, Farrah is not actually claiming that he can prove at every point that Luke's version is later. He's saying, how do you know which one's later and which one is earlier? And he goes over a few examples here. One is in the Beelzebul pericope. One of them says that Jesus casts out uh, demons using the Holy Spirit. And then Luke says, but by the finger of God. How do you know which one's earlier and which one's later? And the same thing with blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you think they're using a common source, then it looks like one of them added something, right? One, Matthew must be later because he says, poor in spirit, whereas the original must have been just the poor. Well, how do you know Luke didn't want to universalize a statement that Matthew had? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And the big example of this is the Lord's Prayer, that Luke has a much shorter version and Matthew has a longer one. And the point is, well, wouldn't Matthew have, have made it longer for and more poetic? rather than think that Luke did the horrible travesty of cutting down the Lord's Prayer. And Ferris' point is, well, these are authors, okay? They, they do things. They, we know Luke actually chopped down parts of Mark. Why, wouldn't, why might he not have shortened Matthew? There is no principle that says an author will always take the material he has and make it longer rather than make it shorter. Third is the argument that 
Luke ought to have used Matthew the same way he used Mark. And this one is really easily confuted because Luke follows Mark in chapters 1 through 10 of Luke, uh, follows Mark's structure carefully, whereas Matthew, for that same material, has rearranged Mark. So it's simply not possible for Luke to follow the structure of both Mark and Matthew. They have different structures. They have different orders in which the stories happen. If Luke is going to use Mark in this way, he has to use Matthew in some other way. This objection doesn't work because there is no other way that Luke could have behaved. We'll talk about Luke's block policy a bit in a second. That is the way Luke treats his two sources. Put that one on hold. Argument number four, Luke's placement of double tradition is in Mark and contexts is less appropriate than Matthew's. And this one to me has always been baffling. Ferrer's response is really simple. It isn't necessary to believe that Luke improved upon Matthew. But to my mind, Luke having less appropriate placements of double tradition than Matthew is actually an argument in favor of Luke's use of Matthew. If Matthew is composing this material for its mark and context, then there's every reason to think that it's going to be perfectly appropriate since Matthew is the person who is writing this stuff up. Luke, on the other hand, is coming around using a written source, Matthew, and a written source, Mark, and trying to find a way to integrate these two things. It's natural that copying out of a written source, rather than composing something de novo, that Luke is going to be a little more awkward and a little more jarring and maybe a little less appropriate than someone who gets to compose this material themselves. Um, worth noting that I'm not saying Matthew made all this stuff up. Uh, I mean, he may have in some places, he may have taken over teaching traditions and reattributed to Jesus, or he may have received this all from some oral tradition. That doesn't matter for this argument. There's no really good reason to think that Matthew is drawing on a written document the same way that Luke is drawing on Matthew in the Pharaoh theory for this double tradition, if you don't believe in Q. There's every reason to think that if the Pharaoh theory is true, then we would expect that Luke would be more awkward, would have less appropriate placements of double tradition than Matthew. And Fair here is often accused of just using the subjective criterion of Luke pleasing this. Well, it just occurred to Luke to do that. And in places he does. But I think he's pointing out more, more or less that, well, just because we don't like Luke's placement doesn't mean that Luke wouldn't have done that. We only would need to show it's capable of pleasing Luke. Number five, Fair concedes it's largely true that Matthew that, that Luke doesn't put his Matthean material in the same Mark and context that Matthew had put it. But his point is, he doesn't put it in Mark and context at all. And he, and he alludes here to Streeter's block policy. According to Streeter, Luke is following first his non Mark and source, and then Mark, and then his non Mark and source, and then Mark in large blocks. He's not taking little bits of material and putting them within Mark and pericopes, he's creating entirely new pericopes, right? Luke is keeping his Mark and material separate and not putting the non Mark and material into the middle of Mark and pericopes. This argument would be more persuasive if Matthew and Luke both placed double traditions in different Mark and pericopes, but that's not what's happening. Luke is placing uh, Mark and stuff with Mark, so he's just reading off of the Gospel of Mark, and then going back and finding the bits of Matthew that he hasn't already used by using Mark, and placing them in separate blocks. So after this, he does sort of a walkthrough with the Lucan travel narrative. He talks about wh how he thinks Luke was working with his sources, and why he made ju the judgments and the editorial decisions that he did. Um, he invokes this notion of the Matthean hexateuch. He comes up with his explanation for why Matthew arranged his gospel into these six sections and then and, and explains Luke's redaction of this material in imitation of Deuteronomy. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on these latter sections because they haven't proved influential. Yeah, as far as I know, no one writing on the Farrer hypothesis has actually followed Ferrer in thinking that the particular Old Testament references he that he thinks influenced Luke are the reason that Luke arranged the Matthean material in his central section from chapters nine or 10 through 18, like nobody follows Ferrer in doing that. And there's one part where Ferrer says, why St. Luke did what he did rather than anything else cannot be the question. He did what he was moved to do. <laughs> and he can fairly be accused of just making this an entirely subjective thing. Luke did put it there because he felt like it. At the same time, the, what's, what is meritorious in this section 
is that Ferrer is acknowledging that we should treat Luke like an author, not as a scribe or compiler. So Ken and I, like all other fair theorists in the world, aren't really persuaded by the argument of this section, but we can defend what Ferrer is trying to do, explain Luke's behavior as the work of a creative mind. I mean, certainly Ferrer, to make the kinds of arguments he's making, needs further controls um, for them to be persuasive and not merely, you know, sort of a entertaining disquisition on the possible psychology of Luke. <laughs> right, and to put that another way, it means you'd have to be able to explain how subjectively this could have attracted Luke. Luke might have liked to have done it that way. You can't simply assert, well, Luke, Luke liked it, and he did it that way. But you can't substitute your own judgment of, well, I don't like it, so therefore Luke didn't do it. Well, that's all for Fares on Dispensing with Q. Ken will revisit the podcast someday to discuss Downing's Towards the Rehabilitation of Q, which is another two-source theorist. Then maybe I can get him back to do Golder and Kloppenberg and Goodacre. Thanks, Ken. Pleasure to be here. Leave us a review. It's easy. Open your podcast app, find our show, scroll down, hit five stars. <laughs> More people will find us. Leave us a positive review, though. Yeah, you can only leave five-star reviews. <laughs> You can find more about us on Twitter at Newt, N-E-W-T, review, or email us at newtestamentreview at gmail.com. Thanks to Mitch and Luke and all the guys from Carnegie for letting us use their song in the intro and outro music of the podcast. You should check them out. I've seen brighter stars than you. I